me. Make sure people can hear me. Just, just kind of raise your, yeah, all right, good. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, three roots of uh, Zen practice that we do. Uh, and I've talked some about them before, but I'm going to, and I won't have much time to go into them in detail, but they are uh, Confucianism, <clears throat> Buddhism, and Taoism. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk from a chart because I think it will help you follow what I'm saying if you can see the chart. So I'm going to call it up now. Let's see if I can do that. I'm <laughs> learning how to do these things. So, uh, Okay, would you, would you also raise your hand if you can see the chart? Good, good. All right, so I'm gonna talk about <laughs> the father of Zen, the mama of Zen, and the governor's or nanny of Zen. <clears throat> so Buddhism and Taoism I'm gonna talk about first, and then I'm gonna bring Confucian is Confucianism in later, although Confucianism is the earliest because Confucian, Confucius lived before either Buddha or Chuangzi and Lao Tzu. So anyway, I'm going to go through this kind of rapidly. Uh, Buddhism is all about, in case you haven't noticed it, discipline and hard work. I mean, we read about inner being but then we want to manifest it. We want to live it. We want to get it into our body, into our hearts. That's hard work. And uh, the Eightfold Path has the two legs of hard work that we do. We start out with the right understanding of the inner being, wow. And then we do the hard work of speech, action, and livelihood. That's the first leg of the path. Um, and then we do meditative leg, concentration, effort, mindfulness, those two legs. And to make a Buddha, to transform our initial faith in, in inner being, there really is an inner being. I really am deeply connected to all you guys and to everyone. Wow, I read that, but then I have to practice with my two legs. And if I just do one leg, I'm gonna fall over. So I practice and I transmute little by little. I transmute the faith that I have with my intention into wisdom, into wisdom. So that takes effort, right? That's, uh, that takes effort. And uh, of course, as since we're the Zen school, we don't de-emphasize speech, action, and livelihood, but we emphasize concentration, mindfulness, and um, effort in, in a meditative capacity. Um, so that's why our main kind of hero historically is Bodhidharma, <laughs> who sits, who sits, his teaching is to sit in meditation for nine years, looking kind of formidable, right? <laughs> and we know that's mythological, but there's significance in it. Um, this takes effort, this takes effort. Miles Davis was asked, how do I learn to play the trumpet like you, like you did? And he said, blow, blow, blow. <laughs> so our meditation is like doing bicep curls for our brain. On the other hand, Taoism, our mama, <laughs> emphasizes spontaneity, laughter, and play. And here's, here's Chuangsen. <clears throat> when the lofty here of Tao, they devote themselves. When the common here of Tao, they wonder if it's real or not. When the lowly here of Tao, they laugh out loud. Without that laughter, it wouldn't be the Tao. 
So many years ago, when uh, Katagiri Roshi, our founding teacher, first came to Minneapolis and lived uh, in an apartment underneath the Zendo in Southeast Minneapolis, I didn't, I was disoriented and uh, on a weekend morning, I, I burst in to their living space. And when I burst in, what I saw was uh, a bunch of uh, uh, three bodies in motion, <laughs> giggling, playing, fighting, but giggling, fighting. And one of them was my teacher, Dainan Katagiri, and the other was his two boys. And I had, and they were just giggling uproariously. I guess there was no meditation going on upstairs. There couldn't have been. <laughs> and that was the first time I had seen that side of him. Because, you know, with the brown and the black and the, we sit like Bodhidharma does. We don't show any affect. I, I didn't even know he had that side. But as I got to know him, I got to really enjoy that side. When Chuangsa was dying fourth century before the contemporary era. His disciples wanted to give him a lavish funeral. And he said, I have heaven and earth for my outer and inner coffin, the sun and moon for my pair of jade discs, the stars for my pearls, the myriad creatures for my farewell presence. Is anything missing from my funeral paraphernalia? What will you add to these? Master, we're afraid that the crows and the kites will eat you. Above ground, I'll be eaten by the crows and the kites. Below ground, I'll be eaten by the ants and moles. Do you rob the one to give to the other? How come you like them so much better? And then he gave a great laugh, <laughs> a great laugh. <laughs> so way back then, he is challenging because Confucius is more than a hundred years before him, he is challenging, well, I'll get to this later, the Confucian funeral burial traditions, which were taken so seriously for the 100, 150 years before Chuangzi. He's rejecting the solemnity and the negativity about death. So we have, after people die at, uh, who are connected with Zen Center, or after your loved ones die, and if they're not connected to Zen Center, you might want to do a little ceremony. We have a little ceremony at the right after death and then a 49 day ceremony. And we keep the person and we're now using animals too because animals are, animals are people, aren't they? Animal people, of course they are. We put their picture on the altar for 49 days. And then we do a, 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 a closing ceremony. And uh, I said that, uh, one time, maybe a couple of years ago, we had pictures all over the altar, which meant that there were a lot of people who had died who were, who were, whom we were honoring. And I said to someone, someone, some friend of mine or something, I don't even remember, somebody who was there, people seemed to be dying all over the place. And my friend whispered, whispered to me, we're next. <laughs> in good Taoist fashion, in good Zen fashion, we're next. <laughs> I think when that happened, he must have been over 65 and I'm way over 65. So the Taoists, even before the Mahayana Buddhists, broke down all, all divisions, the division between faith and wisdom, sacred and profane, self and other, which are fabrications of the mind. So here's a, an example in Zen. A Zen student went to a temple and asked how long it would take him to gain enlightenment if he joined the temple. 10 years, said the Zen master. Well, how about if I really work hard and double my effort? 20 years, said the teacher, <laughs> 20 years. So that's the first, uh, of the four comparisons that I wanna make. The second is iconic perfection and iconoclasm and imperfection of flawedness. So Buddha, uh, 
bodhisattva statues. Most of you have them in your houses, not all of you. That's an icon. That uh, reminds us, that icon, of the inner calmness that Buddha talked about, the stillness, the openness, the joy, the love. We have those icons. We have those icons. They're important. The Eightfold Path, we're moving toward a goal of transforming faith into wisdom. And the Buddha reminds us of that. The Bodhisattvas remind us of that. So those are important, we, important. And then we have, as, as um, Judy was talking last week, we have the, the Paramitas, the perfections. That's what the translate, one of the translations for the Paramitas, the perfections we practice. Generosity, morality, patience, effort, meditation, wisdom. They're the perfections. We're, we're trying to move toward perfection, trying to move toward perfection. And we have icons to help us. On the other hand, our mama <laughs> is an icon, teaches about iconoclasm, teaches about imperfection, teaches about just being flawed, just being flawed because all beings are flawed. So here's a uh, Trongsa, again, in the fourth century before the contemporary era. <clears throat> uh, he's telling the story about two uh, Taoist teachers. <clears throat> Zi Lai went to visit Zi Li. Zi Li's chin was tucked into his navel. His shoulders towered over the crown of his head. His ponytail pointed toward the sky his five internal organs at the top of him, his thigh bones taking the place of his ribs and his yin and yang energies in, in chaos. But Zio says that there is nothing to dislike about his state. Not at all. What is there to dislike? Perhaps he will, he will transform my left arm into a rooster. Thereby I'll announce the dawn. Perhaps he will transform my right arm into a cross, crossbow pellet. Thereby I'll be seeking out an owl, an owl to roast. Perhaps he will transform my ass into wheels and my spirit into a horse. Thereby I'll be riding along. Do I need any other vehicle? Immediately after, Zeli suddenly fell ill. And this time Zeli came to visit him and started addressing the weeping family. Zili said to them, Ach, away with you. Do not disturb his transformation. Leaning across the window cell, he said to the invalid, How great is the process of creation, transformation? What will it make you become? Where will it send you? Will it make you into a mouse's liver? Or perhaps an insect's arm? Flawedness, right? Flawedness, <laughs> moment by moment. So let's even think about Buddha in, in the beginning, in the historical, in the Pali scriptures. And before he died, he said, be a, the Buddha, they wanted him as their icon. He said, be a light to yourself, seek your own salvation. Look not for refuge to anyone besides yourselves. And then for 200 to 300 years after his death, I can't really, they can't seem to pin it down. There were no icons of Buddha. There were no icons because they remembered his words. There was a Dharma wheel, you, and then they had the Bodhi tree, and then they had the lotus flower, but they had nothing representational, no icon other than those. But little by little, it snuck in and then dominated all of Buddhism. So if you go to Southeast Asia, I've just barely been there. You, you, Buddha's all over. Buddha's all over. So flawedness, iconoclasm, imperfection. We all, we are all in this situation. It doesn't matter how long we do our Zen practice, how long we live. So Dogen even, he says, last night this mountain monk unintentionally stepped on a dried turd and it jumped up and covered heaven and earth. This mountain monk unintentionally stepped on it again and it introduced itself saying, my name is Shakyamuni. 
So those are the first two. Discipline, complemented by spontaneity, iconic perfection, just complemented by iconoclasm and imperfection. The third, concepts, scripture, Buddhist, natural world, mama, mama. Concept scripture. And then you read a you read a book that got you sitting in the first place. You you come to hear Dharma talks. We talk in concepts. We study the teachings, the Eightfold Path, as I was talking about, the Paramitas, lots and lots of teachings, on and on and on. Concepts. And now uh, the the priests and I, all of the priests and I including me, I'm a priest too. <laughs> All of us priests have been studying for a year different scriptures with a really good Buddhist scholar. So we can learn them. We can learn them so we can get them more in us. Very important. And we're going to continue, I hope, a second year to study the scriptures. On the other hand, Taoism, natural world. What did Bodhidharma say? He said a special teaching outside the scriptures, outside the scriptures. And here's Chuangsa again. The sage has the sun and moon by his side and the universe under his arm. He blends everything into a harmonious whole. He blends the disparities of 10,000 years into one complete purity. All things are blended like this and mutually involve each other. And we find this, this love of nature, this connection to nature throughout all the best Zen teachings. Dogen himself wanted to leave the urban area, not because he disliked it, because he felt that if he was close to nature and he built a Heiji close to nature, the Zen monastery that's been there for years, now it's a huge tourist place, but <laughs> he, he built it far out from everything to be close to nature. Katagiri and Suzuki, Suzuki wanted a place close to nature when he was with us in, in San Francisco, and we found a place, beautiful place called Tosahara. Katagiri Roshi, no, same, we found Hokioji. Uh, so we can talk about those places, but what about our own backyard? What about the birds in our own backyard? What about the rabbits? What about the squirrels? <laughs> what about the layers of snow every day? Just looking at them, just appreciating them. <laughs> Till yesterday, I, I went out for a nature walk, I think, every day, but maybe two or three days during, during this winter. Yesterday, I just <laughs> decided to run and hide in my, in, in my cozy, under my cozy Afghan. <laughs> but usually I go on a long nature walk because nature helps us feel connected to something bigger than us. Inner being isn't a concept when we look at the sky. We feel it's, it's spaciousness and clarity when we see a bird singing and we feel the 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 poignancy of its song if it's singing in the middle of the cold and and we feel frozen <laughs> the delightfulness of its song because i don't think it's poignant we're the ones who are poignant <laughs> singing there right at 30 below we haven't had any 30 below yet like we used to before just singing there, just singing its heart out, just singing its heart away. <laughs> That's what nature te teaches us to do. Just sing our hearts away. <laughs> it soothes us, reconnecting to our original wisdom, the body, the earth, our own little body is not separate from the body of the earth. Our great mother in Taoism, our great mother, our natural state. And we can enter into this wonderful calmness, this wonderful connectedness. 
by rejecting unnatural behaviors and cultivating the natural, we don't say, I can never get calm enough to enter, to settle into this inner being Tim's talking about. We don't say that. We let go of all or never thinking, either or thinking. Nature doesn't do either or, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> Nature doesn't do all or never, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> I don't know if you want to check it out today. Linda told me today is as cold as yesterday, but it's sunny out there. I'm going to try it. <laughs> so the fourth one, the last one. Restraint of senses. And enjoyment of senses. Papa and Mama. Early Buddhism, Buddhism, until very, very recently, serious practitioners, really serious practitioners who got ordained, took vows of celibacy. It's only been 200 years that uh, Zen teachers in Japan could, could marry. Now, I'm sure they did lots of other stuff. I read a lot about all the other stuff they did because it's but they, they couldn't marry yet because they took a vow of cel celibacy. They had no color in their robes. They had only one robe, only one bowl. This is right, this is in Buddhist time. The second robe was added into China. Let's see, how does it go? I think the second robe was added in China, the third robe in, in Japan. So now there's three layers of robes. Why? Because if we get too graspy, if we get too graspy, um, too greedy to try to get something, um, too craving, uh, it, it disperses our equanimity. We need to fast from sensual pleasure sometimes to cool our senses down. If we don't, our zazen gets all, oh, oh, oh. so first they had no meal after noon. Then in China, it was so hard for the monks to do manual labor in the cold that they have the medicinal meal after noon. So an example of, of how, this, how this occurs and why this is a, actually a good practice uh, to to cool our craving and grasping down as when I was first at the Zen monastery in California. When I was first there, we were a bunch of, I don't know, we didn't even know the word hippie yet, but I guess we were hippies to be maybe. I don't know. So beatniks, ex-beatniks and hippies to be. So we didn't wear many clothes, right? Who wore clothes back then? You guys aren't, you guys aren't old enough to remember that. <laughs> Who wore clothes? especially in nature. And so we would go into the Zendo in the meditation hall with shorts. The women have halter tops. Uh, you know, no segregation. In China and Japan, they segregate because there's too much sexual uh, desire coming up. But we didn't, not only didn't we, did we not segregate, we didn't, we were barely clothed. So Suzuki took the senior people aside and I was not included. I was just told, I don't know why I wasn't a seer, but I wasn't. And said, oh, we have to start, people have to start dressing differently when they come into the meditation hall. Because then they just think about finding a partner or having sex or who they'd like to, although I don't know, I don't know what he said exactly. So then, then we had a dress code, beginning of a dress code. <laughs> oh. So we need to restrain our senses prior to our meditation. We, we need to restrain them or, or we get woo, woo, woo. On the other hand, mama tells us, Chuangzi and Lao Tzu tells us, tell us, enjoy your sensory experience. Enjoy it. Your sensory experience is always in the present. It's your concepts that you get lost in 
whatever you're smelling, you're tasting, you're touching, you're hearing, feeling, enjoy it. And EQ Zen master in Japanese is the best example of this, or you could say the worst example, depending what you think about EQ. In the concrete world right now, enjoy your senses, enjoy your meal, enjoy your sexual experience. I have really been missing for, geez, what is it, 10 months, going to Mia, going to the Minnesota Institute of Arts. Oh, I love to go there. I love to go into the Japanese room and the Chinese room. You know, I'm prejudiced because I'm a Zen teacher. Well, I also like the Native American room very much. <laughs> Those are my three favorite rooms. But I lose my mind. I come to my senses when I'm in those rooms. Do you know what I mean? When you see a beautiful landscape painting, you lose your mind and come to your senses? I think you do. I think you do. I hope, well, uh, Matt said Mia was gonna start to open pretty soon. I don't know if Matt's here today. I, I, think, he, I think he's working actually. So I guess Mia is open. I, I wanna go back. So that's uh, Buddhism and Taoism. Now I'll very quickly, without rushing, <laughs> do Confucianism. Confucianism has a huge impact on Southeast Asian culture, going back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, like way before anything. Supposedly he lived in the fifth century before the contemporary era. Some people say the sixth century. So for Confucius and Confucianism, what Buddhists and others may say about this world being illusory isn't the case. There are no gods. There's no transcendent reality. There is heaven, but heaven isn't like the Buddhist heaven um, and the Mahayana Buddhist heaven that is, or the Christian heaven. It's a cosmic law. It's a moral authority. And emanating from that moral authority is each thing and each thing has its appropriate way of being. Father has an appropriate way of being to son, ruler to vassal, husband to wife, elder brother to younger brother, friend to friend. And there are virtues in Confucianism that are very important to maintain the sacredness and the liveliness and the connection in those relationships. And they're very similar to the paramitas, to the perfections in Buddhism generosity, morality, patience, etc. And individuals and societies ruled by them are in harmony with the universe. Deviation from them invites chaos. So Chinese society way before Buddhism, way before <clears throat> Taoism, well, way before, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, 100, 200 years before, is, is imbued with Confucian, practices. And the final Con Confucian practice that is just really important is Li, rites, rites, rituals, system of ritual norms that determine how we should properly act in everyday life in harmony with these cosmic moral authorities. Taoists make fun of this all the time but it's imbued in Chinese and then it becomes imbued in Japanese culture. Rights replace laws. You don't need lawyers, you don't need law courts, you don't need policing. You just follow the script that a father has in regard to taking care of his son, that a son has in regard to honoring his father. And there's mutual respect, mutual respect. So rights, and you do it in a, in a scripted way, in a ritualized way, and that keeps society going. So then in Dogen, we can see, although he never mentions Confucianism, we can see when Dogen talks about the ritualization of morality, that's coming from the Confucian norms. Oh, the benevolent Roshi who follows the script 
is a son of heaven. The son of heaven. He will reign over a Sangha as orderly as the motions of the planets or the progression of the seasons. Confucianism, and you can see how where Zen got this, is only interested in this world and promoting order through friendly relationships and clearly defined roles. And so at, at any Zen center that comes from the Japanese tradition in the United States, we have the Roshi or the guiding teacher, in this case, two guiding teachers. We have the teachers, we have the Eno or the Tenzo, we have the Dons and the Cheetah and the greeters and servers, and then we have everybody else very hierarchical, but based on mutual respect, mutual respect, mutual respect. So with Lee, each action is a right. So when, when uh, the uh, nested eating bowls, Oriyoki sets were first introduced to the Zen monastery that I was at when I was a young man, Tasahara, uh, my wife went to was one of the first teachers because my wife is very detail oriented. She's meticulous, she's orderly. She learned how to do it very well and she's graceful. Whereas I had an awful time. I, I was in the, in the developmentally disabled group <laughs> and she was my teacher. I won't get into that. <laughs> so, Confucianism is the governess of Zen practice, is the nanny, is the old, the old pair. My son-in-law, who is French, grew, grew up with an, an old pair. And she, she was the one who organized his clothes. She was the one who planned his day. She was the one who talked to him about the importance of being generous when he was fighting with the other kids. Yes, the governess, the nanny. One thing about the governess and the nanny is that often we don't even know about her. That's why we don't know that Confucianism was there for hundreds of hundreds of years, infusing itself ultimately in Zen. Ritualization. Ritual is important. Ritual is important. I, was, I had a friend recently who um, said every morning when he uh, got up for Zazen, especially in winter, he just got on his cushion and he dozed off. <laughs> and he asked, what, he asked me what I thought about that. Well, I said, well, that's okay, but don't call it meditation, call it dozing. <laughs> and he said, well, I want to do meditation. Well, I said, okay, you know, so then he worked out a, a, a little ritual, a pre-Zazen ritual, a tea ritual, just drinking tea. Could it be coffee? Could be the same one. Every part of, part of his activity ahead of time he first gets up is making and drinking with care, attention, and love. He heats up the water, he gets the cup out, he pours the water, he sifts the tea, sits down in a quiet place, and he drinks like it's the most important thing in the world. Then he's ready for zazen. <laughs> he's paying respect to the tea drinking it with slowly, putting the empty cup down, giving thanks once again, and then going to his cushion. So that's what I wanna say about these three. And I, I wanna end by, by um, uh, giving examples, using the analogy of a bridge of all three. And I read, I read about two of them once years ago, so, but the third one I made up myself. So throughout this last year, many of us may have experienced the bridge that's supporting us breaking, either interpersonally, inside, with our culture, with our democracy, <laughs> with you know, social chaos, with having the pandemic, bridge is broken. Oh, oh. If, you don't, if you haven't felt like the bridge is broken in the last year, I wonder what you've been on. I wonder what you're smoking. 
smoking dope is not part of either of these traditions. <laughs> I just want you to know that. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't have any problem with it, but it's not either part of any of these three traditions. So the Buddhist, the bridge breaks. The Buddhist is on the bridge. <laughs> the Buddhist floats down the river, looks about him, and ignoring the discomfort of his situation, the icy water, the burning muscles, he swims to shore. And then he discovers that the river and the shore are not two. <laughs> That's the Buddhist. That's how we transform our faith of right understanding, right intention into wisdom. Because we feel heart mind right in here and feel that it's the heart mind of all life right in here. We feel that, we know that, we live that. Not 100%, nothing is 100%. The Taoist is <laughs> crossing the bridge. <laughs> she falls in the water and decides that since the bridge she was walking on collapsed, she can learn to enjoy floating in a river naturally. So she decides just to be present in the river, breathing, confident that whatever happens and part of the is part of the natural process of the Tao. Radical acceptance of things as it is. Pandemic, Donald Trump, social chaos, democracy falling apart. This is what is. As over the Greeks said, full catastrophe, catastrophe living. That's what the Taoist sages teach us, full catastrophe living. The Confucian swims to shore, calls on a team of skilled workers with a foreman and an assistant foreman with carefully defined roles to rebuild the bridge, beginning with a tightly orchestrated ritual checking to see if all of the formal details of bridge building have been adhered to, rewarding the workers, ending with a magnificent bridge opening ritual. So we've been for what, three years, four years, I don't know, trying to raise money, which we thought about for 20 years before that, 30 years before that to improve our building so everybody can fit in and people aren't cramped. And finally, finally ground has been broken. I mean, Ted and I broke ground figuratively a few months ago, but finally the construction is starting. Wow. So when the construction is finished, we'll want to have a building opening ritual. We will. And that will be wonderful. And even though I am not meticulous by nature, and not orderly by nature. I will do my best and I will have a good time. <laughs> and if I have a good time, you guys will have a good time. So that's what I want to say. And now I'm going to stop sharing and uh, uh, say thank you and tell you that I'm uh, happy to happy to hear anything from you. Any, any comments, any questions, anything, anything.